more than 80 journalists from the country's most read news site called Index. Its independence has come under threat after an Orban ally bought control of the site's access. Protesters march, telling the government to stay clear of media interference. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're watching The Listening Post, working from home. Here are some of the media stories we're covering this week. Hungary, another major news organization, is about to turn pro-government. Prime Minister Orban's work is almost done. More bonkers pseudoscientists on COVID-19 go viral. There is a cure for COVID. It's called hydroxychloroquine. With a little help from their friends in the White House. Making the case for using face masks to stop the spread. Oh masks, oh masks. Why won't people keep you on? Why is this stuff still being debated online? And American news organizations are changing their style guides. We'll examine the reasons they're now spelling black with a capital B. It's a project that's been a decade in the making, but Hungary's Prime Minister Viktor Orban is almost there. He or his backers are now in control of every domestic media outlet that matters. Until about 10 days ago, Index.hu was the only major independent outlet left. That changed on July 21st, when the editor was fired and another 70 journalists showed their support for him by quitting on the spot. Ever since coming into office back in 2010, Viktor Orban has steadily chipped away at Hungary's fourth estate. Numerous outlets have been shut down or seen a drastic change in their editorial lines, usually after an Orban ally takes control. Index was the last one standing. But with its editor gone and the majority of its staff looking for work, it is now Orban's for the taking. Our starting point this week is the Index office in Budapest. It wasn't a matter of if, just a question of when, Hungary's most popular news site, Index.hu, would lose its independence and be turned into a pro-government platform. This past week, that day grew significantly closer. Index's editor-in-chief, Shobach Dul, was fired and at least 70 of his colleagues went out the door with him, resigning in protest over what they called political interference disguised as a corporate shuffle. A few years ago, we announced two main ground rules as the basis of our independent journalism. One of them was that we would write the stories we want with no influence from external parties. The other condition was that the structure of the newsroom would not be influenced externally, and that is what changed over the past few months. Our management wouldn't give us assurances of independence, and then our editor-in-chief was dismissed. That's when senior members of the newspaper decided to resign. And then the entire newsroom stood up and quit. Essentially, these journalists took on a huge existential risk because it was certain that most of them would not find employment as journalists anymore. Job seekers in Hungary's media industry are currently in a desperate position. In terms of freedom of the press, it is a huge loss that Index fell like this because it was a very important news portal and after what happened, it is certain that Index won't have independence in its operation anymore. Index is an extraordinarily successful news site, attracting roughly 1.5 million original views per day in a country of just 10 million. And it was different, the only major online outlet in Hungary that was routinely critical of the Orban government. Since being elected in 2010, Viktor Orban's Fidesz party has brought multiple media outlets to heel, usually indirectly when those outlets are bought out by businessmen tied to the government. Businessmen like Miklos Vasily. Four months ago, he acquired a stake in Indomedia, the company that controls the business side of Index, having already transformed another news site, Origo, from critical to unashamedly pro-Orban. Index's users could see trouble coming, and they didn't have to read between the lines. The site's homepage features a freedom barometer. Up until late June, it read independent, 
the editor's way of saying that the Orban government was not interfering with its reporters. It was a means for them to be able to communicate directly with their readers the level of independence which was prevailing at the site. They needed a, a, a direct channel to the readers to be able to tell them whether the information that they were reading on Index was still credible, was still independent. At the end of June, staff set that, that barometer from independent to in danger. So when this March, Mr. Vasily arrived to Index or in the media, the, the company behind Index, it was an obvious sign for everybody who understands politics in Hungary that the government is pretty much on the threshold of Index and action will be taken very soon. So they came out with this proposal to restructure the whole company and that was the moment when the editor-in-chief decided to move this so-called barometer to give a sign to the public that we are in danger and we need some help. Ownership changes are just one of the ways the Orban government has reshaped the news narrative in Hungary. Government advertising is another. The Fidesz party has steered its ad spending to outlets it approves of, cutting off or limiting the flow of public money to sites like Index. Between the financial pressure and the ownership changes, a host of independent outlets are now shadows of their former selves or have ceased to exist altogether. Names like Here TV, Magyar Nemzet, Népszabadság, and Origa. Orban quite consciously started restructuring the media since 2010, using partly legal and partly economic tools. I think the most symbolic moments were when outlets were abolished or completely restructured. One of them was Origo in 2014, where all the journalists resigned. In 2016, they shut down the Nepsa Butchuk newspaper overnight, and its whole editorial board was jobless. And of course, in 2020, the index case is similar. After all these developments, it will be very difficult to talk about independent media in Hungary. And index obviously was one of the last steps to, to gain full control over the Hungarian media for Fidesz, the government party. The brand was so strong that hundreds of thousands of people would read you and that's like, as I said, in such a small market as the Hungarian, that's a huge thing. The collapse of index is really is a disaster for Hungarian media. It is. I mean, I, I can't overemphasize this fact. The thousands who have taken to the streets in protest over the mass resignations at index are familiar with the pattern. The corporate takeover, the subsequent personnel changes, the inevitable pro-government turn. The question they typically ask at such demonstrations has always been, which media outlet will be next? The more contemporary version of that question would be, who else is left? With the takeover of Index, the gold standard of independent media in Hungary has basically been laid to rest. But there still are a number of outlets with very brave and very talented and courageous journalists. One happens to be an outlet which I contribute to, which is called 444.hu. There's another outlet called 24.hu. There's a weekly print magazine and their website, which is called hvg.hu, and uh, a number of others. Whether some of these uh, independent outlets which remain that I mentioned uh, will themselves be subject to uh, interventions uh, from government type businessmen or, or via any other avenue, also remains to be seen with index uh, out of the picture. The crown jewel has really been plucked, and I, and I think that uh, there might not even be a need to go after the remainder. I'm very sad, not just because I lost the job I loved in a place I worked for almost 20 years, but because as a Hungarian citizen, I'm disturbed that there are fewer and fewer independent news outlets that provide factual information. I can't predict the future, but I hope that my ex-colleagues and I can stay together and carry on with the professional work we started 20 years ago at Index. We have created a Facebook page called The Leavers from Index, and we're using that page to stay in touch with those readers who would like to know what the future holds for us. Conspicuous by its near absence in this story is the European Union 
which professes to demand of its member states freedom of the press. Prime Minister Orban, who openly says he wants his country to be an illiberal democracy, has made a mockery of that requirement. The European Parliament has long threatened to suspend Hungary's EU voting rights, but still hasn't lifted a finger. The lack of political will in Brussels is evident. So the Orban government continues to cleanse the country's media of its critics. And since Hungary gets far more in funding from the EU than it puts in, some of the money the government is using to do that is coming from Brussels itself. We've heard that, uh, that they're concerned uh, and that they're closely following the media environment in Hungary. But what we haven't heard very much is how they feel about the fact that European money is being used to create a class of oligarchs and capitalists within Hungary who are then using that capital to create the media environment which we face today. It would be uh, worth asking these tough questions to the European Union until when are they going to be comfortable financing the construction uh, of a class of oligarchs which directly contributes to the disintegration of media freedom in Hungary. We're looking at another media story that's on our radar now with one of our producers, Tarek Nafa. Tarek, in the U.S., a video full of debunked theories on COVID-19 goes viral in a big way with the help of President Trump. Eventually, it gets taken down. First of all, who produced the video in question? A group that calls itself America's Frontline Doctors. They put together a press conference that was live streamed by the right-wing media outlet Breitbart. And they stood on the steps of the Supreme Court and essentially told Americans they're being lied to. There are many thousands of physicians who have been silenced from telling the American people the good news about the situation, that we can manage the virus. Some mind-boggling conspiracy theories and misinformation have exploded during this pandemic. And this video wrapped up 20 million views in just a few hours before being taken down by Facebook. Twitter, where Donald Trump and his son also posted this video, they removed it too. But it's out there all over the place now. And once again, hydroxychloroquine was made out to be some kind of cure for the coronavirus. That's right, Richard. The bit of this video that got the most attention, including from President Trump, is the testimony of a doctor from Texas called Stella Emanuel. Today I'm here to say it, that America, there is a cure for COVID. All this foolishness is not, does not need to happen. There is a cure for COVID. There is a cure for COVID. It's called hydroxychloroquine. Emmanuel has a history of making some outlandish claims. She said that gynecological issues faced by women were the result of them having sex with demons in their dreams. She also alleges alien DNA is being used in medical treatments. But she clearly has a fan in President Trump who's advocated the use of hydroxychloroquine multiple times. Uh, there was a, a woman who was spectacular in her statements about it, uh, that she's had tremendous success with it. And they took her, they took her voice off. I don't know why they took her off, but they took her off. Maybe they and once you take down a video offering all these conspiracy theories, then you inevitably feed into some of those theories, do you not? Exactly. And it allows the likes of Fox News to say that Emmanuel is a truth teller who's been cancelled. Uh, that she's been disappeared from the internet because her message of hope benefits Donald Trump. And of course, this is an American election year in which these platforms have to grapple with this kind of material. And they're facing a lot of heat right now. OK, thanks, Tarek. Major news stories such as the police killing of George Floyd, a black man in Minnesota back in May, do more than dominate news agendas. They have a way of changing things. The wave of anti-racism demonstrations and campaigns that followed Floyd's killing have affected all kinds of American institutions. Media organizations have not been immune, nor should they be. From the lack of diversity in their newsrooms to the problems with how black people are reported on, American media have a vast range of issues to address. Some significant news organizations, the Associated Press, the Los Angeles Times, Fox News, have all made a change that may have caught your eye. It involves a single letter, the B in black, which they are now putting in uppercase. 
It doesn't sound like much, it's nowhere near enough, and it took a long time to happen. The Listening Post's Minakshi Ravi now on the campaign for and the significance of the uppercase black. Black has meant many things over time, but I think we're seeing it emerge in this day and age as an important unifying rallying cry for us to, um, to resist this historical oppression that we've experienced. Black people for so long weren't allowed to name ourselves. You know, labels were thrust upon us. Even our own given names were thrust upon us. So I think at the end of the day, Black people should be allowed to define themselves and call themselves what they want to. Naming in and of itself, I think, has to be understood as a matter of power and representation. There has never been a moment in the history of the United States in which racial terms have not been somehow fraught, right? There has been a discussion about capitalizing being Black for a very long time, and Black people have been saying for a while, like, this is how Black people identify, and you guys don't identify them properly. So they are trying to uh, rectify wrongs um, and capitalizing the being black was a very low-hanging fruit that they immediately took um, and I'm happy that they did. Notice so many American news outlets, AP, LA Times, NBC, have over the past few months announced that they will be capitalizing black, making it an uppercase B. This isn't a recent debate though, is it? Six years ago, you wrote an opinion piece for the New York Times, making the case for exactly this. Can you explain what the debate is here? Sure. I mean, I don't really think of it as a debate in terms of what these words actually mean. Lowercase b black is a color. Capital B refers to a group of people whose ancestors come from the African continent. To me, it's a very simple difference. One is a color, one is a group of people. So there's no significance to the capital B beyond that? It's literally the distinction between a color and a people? This is why this, this, this debate, this question, is both so simple and yet so meaningful. This question of whether or not you're going to capitalize the black when you refer to black people is a, is a sign of respect. It's saying, I recognize you as a distinct group of people, and you're beyond a color right? That you have a culture. I see the culture. I respect the culture. I respect you as a human being worthy of the same level of respect as any other culture. I want to pick up on that notion of culture, black culture. How do you arrive at a unified culture for a people who are so diverse? Is there a consensus on what constitutes blackness? Well, I think it's going to be impossible to come with a unified consensus, right? Because there are many different ways of experiencing blackness. There is internal diversity within our community. But that doesn't stop us from talking about a set of shared history and a set of shared experience. So that even if I think of myself as having a unique black experience, I'm still exposed to the same external system that has treated African Americans um, in a way that that marginalizes us and that that keeps us from accessing the fullness of our rights as citizens and our full humanity. With the Black Lives Matter movement, there appears to be a renaissance of the term black, whereas before African American was more widely used. So what's changed, Matthew? What's brought black back into such widespread use? So racial terms are incredibly slippery, let's call them. That is, they never have one precise definition or application. And when we think about the racial category of quote unquote black, um, there are many synonyms that have been used. The meanings of these terms vary quite a bit and depends how and where we're using them. Black is a term that's been around in American society um, since you know, the beginning of this country, but it's a term that historically signified a kind of dehumanization of this group of, of enslaved Africans who were brought to the United States. We see a radical shift happening with that term in the 1960s. So we see the Black Power Movement arguing for a reclaiming of that term, turning that into a rallying cry for people to think about um, self-determination, to think about um, how we can reclaim and rename ourselves and have power over the label that's used for us. This word Black refers to a racial group, but race itself is a really hotly contested concept, isn't it? 
a lay person, I think, understanding of race and ethnicity would be uh, believing that there are biological, easily identifiable characteristics that one can see. But sociologists, anthropologists, biologists, geneticists, and genomicists are now on all on the same page that race actually doesn't have any biological existence. That is, when we look for racial types by bone, we cannot find them. When we look for them by blood type, we cannot find them. Race is a biological fiction with a social function, right? It plays a role and helps us identify and sort people. So, okay, to state the obvious then, Laurie, if we're going to capitalize the B of black, then why don't we capitalize the W of white? I understand the question, I understand the conversation, but I do not think that the answer is what's good for the blacks is good for the whites, not in this scenario at all. White people have never wanted to be treated the same way as black people, ever. White people have never said, what you're doing to the blacks, do it to us too, never. The other thing is that white supremacists are very actively used the capital W to identify their white supremacist culture. So that adds a bit of a question mark also whether or not you want to adopt this capital W when it does mean something. It means white supremacist. I want to understand how this campaign for the capital B worked within news organizations, Erin. For example, at your paper, the LA Times. During the anti-racism protests, there was a lot more being discussed than just a capital B, am I right? When the protest around George Floyd um, took off, uh, there was concern with how media was covering it um, and how they were covering Black people in general. To us, the coverage was tied to there not being any Black people in the room to say, that photo selection is terrible, the caption selection is terrible, the, this, the whole premise of this story is racist. <laughs> we all thought it was important to have this discussion in the open. That conversation is what sparked um, the larger conversation that we're having now on the, its treatment of Black staffers and the way in which it covers Black people. From that, management decided to capitalize the being Black, to rectify a big wrong in a small, meaningful way. So it must be a big relief to managers of American media outlets that the deep systemic changes that are needed, you know, diversity in newsrooms, the representation of black people in coverage, all of that can wait a bit because after all, they've gone and capitalized the B. Yeah, I had to admit that I laughed when I saw this, this question because it's absolutely the experience of many black Americans today that we're asking for incredibly deep systemic change and it seems like we're getting surface level responses. Now that's not to trivialize the importance of capitalizing that B. That B does important symbolic work, but we also wanna see the rest of the work being done. For US media to really address race and racism in a critical, truthful, empirically driven way, would be to study, for example, the diffusion of anti-Black ideologies in the United States and how they come to function in our institutions, how they structure and guide our interactions from who we marry to where we live to how long we live. If media could interrogate those in an honest way to admit that white supremacy is still quite normative and that anti-blackness is a still quite normative way of making sense of the world, then we would have completely different storytelling about our local communities, our states, and the nation writ large. And finally, there's an absolutely moronic culture war underway over COVID-19 and the use of face masks. More and more countries have made face masks compulsory in enclosed public spaces, which has turned social media spaces into battlegrounds between anti-maskers and people who happen to believe that saving lives comes before someone's idea of what constitutes personal freedom. That's a societal fault line that divides America these days. One that the online comedy troupe Funny or Die examines in this next video. It's entitled, An Ode to Masks. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. Oh masks, oh masks. Cute little face flaps, no bigger than a pigeon. You protect me from diseases and allow me to cover my unattractive face. And for that, I want to thank you. Oh, masks, oh, masks. 
a guy I went to high school with, thinks you are a hoax. He is a Facebook insul now. He thinks he knows better than doctors, but once drank an entire bottle of mayonnaise just to get a laugh. Oh masks, oh masks. Why won't people keep you on? The other day, a woman standing in front of me in line at the supermarket removed hers just to cough and then put it back on. Oh masks, oh masks. Thin strips of cloth. You can get designs printed on them. I had one custom made. It says, I hate humanity on it. People compliment me on the streets. Oh masks, so oh, masks. Face diapers that cover up my bad breath. Cloaks for my adult acne. A new way to advertise my favorite brands across my mouth. Cheap and easy street fighter costumes. Indicators of selfishness. And for that, I want to thank you.